Good evening. If I could ask you all to take your seats. My name is Michael Murray, and I work in institutional advancement here at the college. I also have the privilege and honor of being a United States Marine. It's my pleasure to welcome you here tonight to our talk, America's Nobility, Leadership, and Exceptionalism of Americans Veterans. I have the honor and privilege of serving as the MC and host also our distinguished guest, Major General Brady. Having spent the last 24 hours with General Brady, I can tell you that you are all in for a very special evening with the chance to hear from this great American patriot and hero. Last night as I drove General Brady from the airport to campus, he mentioned to me that when he was awarded the Medal of Honor in 1969, there were just over 400 living Medal of Honor recipients. Currently, General Brady is one of 69 living Medal of Honor recipients. So this truly could be a once in a lifetime opportunity for all of us here tonight. And for that, I think you will all join me in being extremely grateful. Here at Hillsdale, we start all events with an invocation and the pledge. And leading us tonight will be a very special person. In my research on General Brady, I got to see some of his uh, talks over the years, and he takes great pride in talking about the military spouse. And I think he'll probably cover that topic tonight. Well, this evening, we have our own military spouse with us, Mrs. Roma Rogers. Roma is married to Hillsdale's own Associate Dean of Men, Jeff Rogers, affectionately known around campus as Chief. Roma spent 26 years serving our nation as a Navy spouse, during which time she moved the Rogers family all over the globe, stationed on both the east and west coasts of the continental United States to Oconus, outside the continental United States, duty stations in Iceland and Japan. Roma and Jeff ended their career in the Navy in Lansing, Michigan. Upon Jeff's retirement, he came to work at Hillsdale. Roma herself works in higher education at Spring Arbor. Please join me in welcoming an outstanding military spouse, Ms. Mrs. Roma Rogers. Right. Good evening, everyone. Would you please bow your head for prayer? Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I praise you, Lord. I thank you, Lord, for being the one and only Lord. I thank you for our men and women who have served us well, Lord, the ones who have, the ones who are, and the ones who will do to come, Lord. I ask for strength, stability, and support as you continue and as they continue to be within your will, Lord. I praise you and I thank you. In Jesus' precious name I pray, amen. Please stand for the pledge. I cannot see. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, individual, liberty, and justice for all. Thank you. Before we get to the main event this evening, we have the honor of witnessing the inaugural awarding of the Admiral Peter Hess Beckwith Memorial Scholarship. This scholarship is given in honor of Admiral Beckwith's service to our nation and as a board member of the Hillsdale County Veterans Hall of Valor. Before I ask the presenter to join us, let me take a moment to share with you a little bit about Admiral Beckwith. Admiral Beckwith was born in Battle Creek, Michigan and graduated from Hillsdale College in 1961. Following that, Admiral Beckwith earned his Master's of Theology and served in ministry his entire life. In his civilian life, he served as the Episcopal Bishop of Springfield, Illinois, before retiring in 2010 and returning to Hillsdale College, where he served as our college chaplain until 2016. Admiral Beckwith served our nation in the Chaplain Corps of the United States Navy Reserve for 27 years, rising through the ranks to serve as the Deputy Chief of Chaplains for the Naval Reserves, retiring as a Rear Admiral. I first met Admiral Beckwith when I started working for the college in 2011 
And because he had spent so many years in the Navy serving the Marine Corps, he would always remind me that the Marine Corps is part of the Department of Navy. I would affectionately refer to him, that's right, the men's department. <laughs> because of that, he took a liking to me and we became close friends and he became an invaluable mentor to me. In September 2019, Admiral Beckwith was diagnosed with cancer and a month later, the good Lord called him home. I think I speak for all the college and the Hillsdale community when I say that the loss of Admiral Beckwith hit us hard and we dearly miss his infectious enthusiasm in all things related to the Hillsdale community and our great nation. Admiral Beckwith is survived by his wife, Melinda, also a Hillsdale College graduate, an outstanding military spouse, and his sons, Peter and Michael, and their families. And I am pretty sure the Beckwith family are watching tonight via our, our live stream, and I offer our best wishes to them as we honor Admiral Beckwith. Joining us this evening to present the scholarship to the very first recipient is Dr. John Williams, also a Hillsdale College graduate. Dr. Williams serves as president of the board for the Hillsdale County Hall of Valor. Dr. Williams served on that board with Admiral Beckwith and he joins us tonight. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Williams to the stage. I'm also an Air Force veteran and uh, spent uh, 22 years in the Air Force. So we're well represented tonight with our, our veterans. But it's my pleasure tonight to um, award the first memorial scholarship to the, as the uh, Admiral Peter Hess Beckwith Memorial Scholarship to a young lady who's one of the Hillsdale County High School's seniors this year we offered this scholarship to applicants from any of the Hillsdale County high schools, and we had a great many uh, applicants to uh, compete for this scholarship, and uh, it's my pleasure to tell you a little bit about this year's winner. And her name is Rayanne Van Aken, as I mentioned, a senior at Camden Frontier High School, and uh, she participates in basketball and track. She's also in 4-H. She uh, showed animals in 4-H and was a super show woman. And uh, she's also a member of uh, uh, the Future Farmers of America. And she is involved in several volunteer community activities. Her letters, letters of recommendation said that Rayanne uh, gives everything she has. She goes all out for everything, anything she's involved in. So if she commits to something, she's going to do her best. She sets the examples for her peers and for others in the community. So she has uh, done a lot into the community, and her letters of recommendations were outstanding. In her essay, she highlighted that um, she was thankful that some of her family members had served as veterans, and she talked a little bit about her great-grandfather who was a World War II vet, and her grandfather who was a Vietnam vet who died of cancer from Agent Orange. And then she went into talking about when she's on the basketball court at the beginning of a game, she looks across the court to the veterans who are saluting the flag during the playing of the national anthem. She thinks about all that she's thankful for, for what they have sacrificed and done for the rest of us. So she was the one that the board members picked to be our award winner this uh, evening. And I'm honored to congratulate Rayanne Van Aken. And the scholarship is for $1,500 to the university she chooses to go to. Congratulations, Rayanne. Tonight we have Dr. Peter Jennings here to not only introduce our guest of honor, but to help us learn a little bit more about Hillsdale College's rich military heritage. 
Dr. Jennings is the Associate Professor of Management and the McIntyre Chair in Business Administration. He joined Hillsdale College faculty in 2016 teaching and also teaches undergraduate, graduate, and executive education courses in leadership, ethics, and management. Dr. Jennings earned his undergraduate degree from Miami University, his master's in business administration from Michigan State, and his PhD in management from Arizona State. Dr. Jennings is also a proud veteran serving as an infantry officer in the United States Marine Corps and research director for the U.S. Army's Center for Army Profession and Ethics at the United States Military Academy at West Point. His military service includes three combat tours in the Gulf, Iraq, and Afghanistan, in which he earned numerous personal awards, including a Bronze Star Medal with V Device for Valor. Since coming to Hillsdale, Dr. Jennings has been a champion advocate for our student veterans, helping them get the support they needed to be successful students. Dr. Jennings is extremely passionate in helping our Hillsdale community understand the importance of the connection the college has to military service. And it is my honor to welcome Dr. Peter Jennings, who will also introduce our guest speaker. Dr. Peter Jennings. It was May 10th, 1864, a cool, foggy Virginia morning. Sergeant Moses Luce has just lost five of his seven soldiers in a failed attack on a rebel position heavily defended. As his decimated regiment regrouped at the original battle line, Sergeant Luce heard someone calling him from the field. Luce, I'm bleeding to death, I'm bleeding to death. He knew the voice, it was one of his old college friends and he apparently was dying under the guns of the enemy where he would die if left without help. Sergeant Luce dropped his musket, leapt over, left over the ditch and rushed out onto the field forward towards the rebel lines. He felt the musket balls whizzing past his head. He found a soldier lying prostrate, one leg shattered by grape shot. He stooped down over him and said, Le Fleur, I have come for you. He got Lafleur on his back, and as low as he could, almost creeping, he carried him back to, through his own lines to a little house. He found the regimental surgeon. Lafleur's leg was shattered below the knee. The surgeon had to amputate it and bound up his wounds. But Lafleur's life was saved. Thus did Sergeant Luce rescue his wounded college friend and comrade. For this action, Sergeant Luce was awarded the Congressional Medal of Honor. He was the second of three Hillsdale College students who would receive that honor during the Civil War. A hundred years later, a Major Patrick Brady would accomplish similar rescues, not in the mountains of Virginia, but in the mountains and jungles of Vietnam. He would not rescue one soldier, but more than 5,000 American and Vietnamese soldiers, as well as civilians and even some enemy. And he did not do it using black Cadillacs for his ambulance, but in the air using UH-1 Huey helicopters for his ambulance. But unlike the rebels who ceased firing when they saw Sergeant, what Sergeant Luce was doing, General Brady's enemies wouldn't show him the same courtesy. But like Sergeant Luce, General Brady would also receive the Congressional Medal of Honor for his actions, among many other awards for valor and meritorious service. Major General Patrick Brady was born in 1936 in Phillips, South Dakota. He graduated from Seattle University in 1959 and was commissioned as second lieutenant in the Army Medical Services Corps. He served 34 years in the Army in all stations around the world. He was in Berlin in 1961 when the wall went up and he was there again in 1989 when it went down. He served two tours in Vietnam as a helicopter ambulance pilot. General Brady is one of our country's most decorated living veterans. 
He's the only living Army veteran to hold both the Medal of Honor and the Distinguished Service Cross, our nation's highest, second highest award. A list of his other military awards include two Distinguished Service Medals, the Defense Superior Service Medal, the Legion of Merit, six Distinguished Flying Crosses, two Bronze Stars, one for Valor, 53 Air Medals, one for Valor, and the Purple Heart. And there are others. He's recognized as a top helicopter pilot in Vietnam and is a member of both the Army Aviation and the Dust Off Hall of Fame. General Brady and his wife Nancy, now deceased, had six children. All of them served in the military. Megan served in the Army Medical Service Corps and is a veteran of the Iraq War. Those are just some of the highlights of General Brady's military CV, if you will. For the benefit of our students, I want to add a little color to this extraordinary service record. General Brady was a pioneer and a leader of the famed Army dust-off units, medical service units that specialize in aeromedical evacuations. The call sign dust-off came about because their choppers would literally disappear in a cloud of dust that they turned up when they took off from the pickup zone. But dust off signified more than a radio call sign. It was, Viet it was the Vietnam grunts 9-11. As I should say, 9-1-1. Uh, Sorry for the slip up there. It was the grunts 9-1-1, the call they would make when they needed medical help. And the dust off units proved reliable first responders. General Brady's dust off unit rescued more than 21,000 patients. And remarkably, they never left a patient in the field. In total, Army dust off units were directly responsible for saving close to one million lives. And as noted, General Brady would be personally responsible for saving more than 5,000 lives. Such exceptional performance was the fruit of highly innovative tactical techniques developed by General Brady, some of them against Army regulations but they enabled his unit to conduct rescue missions day or night in any kind of terrain or weather, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Such high-risk heliborne rescue missions came with a price. Dust-off crews and pilots faced more danger and suffered the highest casualty rate of any aviation units in Vietnam. I read General Brady's book that recounts his Vietnam experiences, Dead Men Flying. It's a fascinating read. Among many things, I gained a new appreciation for those long underappreciated Vietnam veterans. Also notable in the book is that General Brady doesn't dwell on himself. He gives credit to his mentors and senior leaders, especially his first commander, Major Charles Kelly, the father of Dustoff, and of course his crew members. It seems General Brady's martial courage is topped only by his Christian humility. So I'd also like to just add a few highlights, anticipating that General Brady might not expand on these too much, about his actions that earned him the Medal of Honor. The missions began before sunrise, and they lasted long into the night non-stop, without a break. First mission were two Vietnamese soldiers. They were isolated on a mountaintop, fog 100 miles deep. Seven rescue attempts had already failed. General Brady got them out. Second mission, 60 casualties, heavy fog again, surrounded by enemy. Two helos had already been shot down and numerous other attempts to rescue them had failed. General Brady got them out. Third mission, two wounded Soldiers, heavy enemy contact. General Brady got him out under fire. There was other missions, 12 casualties rescued. There was one harrowing rescue mission in a minefield, 50 casualties. General Brady was able to land in a minefield and get him out. General Brady described that day as a three aircraft day. He lost two aircraft. He didn't stop. 
got them all out. 111, they estimate, lives were saved by General Grady and his crew that day. And it was for these missions, for this service and sacrifice above and beyond the call of duty that earned him the Medal of Honor. That brings me back to Sergeant Luce and the Hillsdale College Civil War veterans. Moses Luce and his friend Asher LaFleur are among 400 Hillsdale College students that served in the Civil War. Some notable, notable facts about these 400. All were Christian patriots who fought to preserve the Union and defend liberty and abolish slavery. All were volunteers. And most, including Luce and LaFleur, volunteered at the very start of the war and served for the duration or until they were wounded or killed. Half became officers, three became regimental commanders, one became a general. Many acquitted themselves with exceptional courage, including three, as already noted, who won the Medal of Honor. And at least 16 and possibly many more, maybe up to 200, our records aren't certain because many of our students went back to their home states to serve and we don't have records, died in service during the war and many more suffered grievous and debilitating wounds. This service record that I'm highlighting is exceptional among American colleges. Indeed, so great was Hillsdale College Civil War service that the Detroit Advertiser Tribune, the leading newspaper of the time, noted that probably no college in the country is better represented in the Union Army than Hillsdale. It has sent its young men to war by the hundreds, and they have watered with their blood every battlefield in the Republic. And here's my point. All colleges of higher learning pursue truth. We pursue truth. But we also defend liberty. Defending liberty is a tradition of this college. It defines who we are and what we stand for as a college community. That tradition was born in the service and sacrifice of the students of the Civil War generation, and it is memorialized in a soldier's monument that stands center in our campus in front of Central Hall. This tradition has been passed down as an inheritance, a sacred trust from one Hillsdale College generation to the next. And Hillsdale College students have remained faithful to that trust, serving in every branch of our armed forces, in every war, and during peacetime. Because of this tradition, Hillsdale College honors the long blue line of men and women who have defended liberty by serving in our armed forces, from the Civil War to Vietnam, from the Revolution to Iraq and Afghanistan. It is therefore fitting, especially on this Veterans Day, that we have the high honor of welcoming tonight one of our country's greatest military heroes. Now I'd like to ask you to stand and join me in welcoming Major General, Pat Major General Patrick Brady. to hear what a fine fellow I am. <clears throat> I just wish my wife could be here to hear what a fine fellow I am. But more than that, I wish my wife's mother could be here. <clears throat> it's dangerous to have a general. You know, there's three kinds of generals. Those that, get, that can count and those that can't count. Now, before I start, I got strict instructions <clears throat> to recognize from Texas, Sophie and Rose Coster, who are students here and have relatives in Texas, and Reed Law. So if I didn't do that, it'd be trouble when I get back to my neighborhood. <clears throat> <clears throat> Excuse me. Alexander Solzhenitsyn warned about the dangers of a nation amputating its memory of silent generations growing old 
and dying without ever talking about themselves either to each other or to their descendants. So I'm going to talk to you about some life lessons from my generation and from those we honor today, American veterans. American veterans believe that life has no meaning unless lived for the benefit of future generations. And some of us do this actually as a way to live our lives over again. Now, I saw a poll that said many of us would do things differently if we could do it over again, if we could live our lives over again. I know I'm not the man I would have liked to be. Can't change all that. However, the truth is we can do it over again, just not for ourselves. Too late. But we can do it over again through our children, through the young people. None of us are failures if our children succeed, if we can help children, all children, all young people succeed. So how do we do that? Someone said that every so-called hero at last becomes a bore. Now I'm going to talk to you about some heroes, those of us who wear the Medal of Honor and other heroes, our veterans, do to keep from becoming bores. And at the same time, we kind of live our lives over again. A boss once told me, <clears throat> after I'd really messed something up, he said, don't feel bad, Pat. No one is a complete failure. They can always serve as a bad example. <laughs> and that's why a guy like me, even as a bad example, why we still have some worth. You can't live as long as I have, messed up as often as I have, and not have something worthwhile to pass on for the benefit of future generations. Now, we find a recurring plea uh, uh, among many disadvantaged students to teachers and others that you have not been where we've been. And that, of course, is true in many cases. However, it's not true about our veterans. They have been where those students have been, and then some. It's hard for a student, no matter how disadvantaged he may be, to make that case to a one-armed or one-eyed veteran. Now, we, learn that, we know that learning is most effective with witnesses. We hear that some teachers tell, some explain, some, some demonstrate, but I believe the best teachers inspire. And for this reason, the Medal of Honor recipients, veterans, so-called heroes, can be uniquely effective as teachers and role models for many students. Now, we've used this medal as a training aid <clears throat> to form our character development program, which we've spread across America for the last 15 years or so. It's available, it's online, it's free, and I hope that this, this great college will take a look at it. What do we mean by character? It's not, as we are told, who you are when you're alone. Being alone does not magically identify you. We all have a high regard for ourselves, merited or not. By character, I mean the you God knows. Now, we all go about this in our own way. Many of us may moralize a bit, which I personally think we need more of. Some people don't like moralizing. I believe for the most part it's because they don't like morals. But I will tell you how I do it when I speak to the students out there and also to the teachers. I explain that this medal is a symbol. Symbol is from the Greek word meaning half token, which when joined with the other half represents something above and beyond itself, much greater than itself. For example, the other half token of our flag is the Constitution and the Declaration. When you burn or disrespect old glory, you burn and disrespect our founding documents. The other half token of this medal is courage, sacrifice, and patriotism, the foundation of our sovereignty, our freedom, and our future. These are the values behind the valor. Valor is finite, values are infinite. In fact, both valor and values come from the same, same Latin root, valere. <clears throat> but within that symbolism, the symbolism of the medal is the key to success in life, to happiness in life, and to the security of our nation. 
I'm Leave, and I, I, I thought I was going to be talking to mostly young people here, and I think we have some of them. But I believe that most young people, most of us are interested in not only in being successful in life, but also in being happy. So while I'm going to focus on the keys to success, success and happiness, and success and happiness can fun be a function of who your heroes are, so I'm going to define for you what a hero is. And freedom, I think, it is very important to understand who is responsible for our freedom and how to stay free, so I'm going to explain that. And of course, at the end, there's a test. Now, I don't know if I can give a test to some of you guys out here, but I'm going to try. Now, America has no kings or queens, no dukes or duchesses, but we do have a nobility. <clears throat> America as nobility is what this day is all about, our veterans. Their titles are private and sergeant, grunt for my friend Steve, Lieutenant and General are simply GI. At the top, however, is the KIA, the WIA, and the POW. Unlike other nobilities, their titles were not inherited. They were earned through their blood, sweat, and tears. And that is the hallowed trinity that secures our freedom, the blood, sweat, and tears of our nobility. Without veterans, without our nobility, we would not be free. Veterans are the vault for the values of America, and that is what we would like to see honored, the values for which we fought. Now, I believe that the highest form of patriotism is service to our youth, and what is most important is that our youth know and understand these values, and know that values are what we honor when we honor our veterans. They brought freedom to so many, not just our allies, but our enemies as well, and the young people need to know this. And they need to know about those who did not make it, those who sacrificed all the spring times of their life so that liberty might grow old. They need to know that the noblest part of their being did make it. It stays with us, becomes a part of our being as a people. Everywhere in this great land, a part of our common ideals and feelings we have for each other, of all those things that make us a united country, a singular people, a people who enjoy each other's company and wish each other well. A preacher friend once said to me that if love is to survive, <clears throat> it must be expressed. Now that's so true in our families, in our workplace, in our, in our units. If it is to survive, it must be expressed. But it's true of other expressions as well, honoring veterans and our heroes. They do not believe they did this country a favor by their service and sacrifice. They believe that God did them a favor by allowing them to be born here. Now, let me add to America's nobility their families and that exquisite creature known as the military wife. There she is. I've been almost dead many times, but I never went through anything as agonizing as when my daughter went into combat and I wasn't there to protect her. Our wives have gone, over, gone through this over and over again as we deploy and come back and deploy again. I believe that Adam's rib was the greatest investment in history. C.S. Lewis, in his condemnation of moral relativism and a valueless society, he wrote about men without chess. <clears throat> and I'm sure you folks here have studied him. What a great writer he was. The chess for Lewis symbolized a spiritual element, the value center of a person. It was the indispensable connection between the head, the intellectual, the mental element, and the belly, the visceral, emotional, passionate part of our nature. Balance comes when the head rules the belly through the chest. Danger comes from peoples and nations without chest. From intellectuals without values, human animals governed by passion and instinct and power alone. True evil is not a disease, it's a decision. And the world is full of evil and those who don't have chest. 
Veterans are kind of like America's chest. They are, as I said, the vault for our values. They have protected those, us from those among us and those in the world who don't have chess. So what do veterans teach us about the keys to success in life? <clears throat> I'm sure by now that many of you young people and certainly the rest of you know that life is not fair. We are simply not all born equal, certainly not in terms of ability and opportunity. Look around you, you're gonna see many who are smarter, bigger, faster, stronger, better athletes, better looking, and most important, they have better hair than you do. And you will find those who were born with so much more opportunity than you did. But none of that is important, because in the most important way, we are all born equal. And that way is in terms of courage. Each of us can have all the courage we want, you can't use it up. God has made this marvelous gift infinitely available to each one of us, and guess what? Courage is the key to success in life. It's a great and proven equalizer in life. It produces great people from those among us who were not born with great ability, who were not given great opportunity. And once we realize that we can have all the courage we want, and that is the key to success in life. It eliminates all those distractions as to who and what we can be. Mediocrity and failure become choices. They have nothing to do with chance. You can be as successful as you have the courage to be, and God will give you all the courage you want. If we agree on this, we see that in many ways, failure is a function of cowardice. By, by the way, this business of <clears throat> self-esteem, what does that even mean? Participation trophies. I think that unmerited self-esteem is a success killer. Many of us are way up here in our opinions of ourselves, way down here in our performance, which should be how we judge ourselves. Ba veterans are mostly known for battlefield, physical kind of courage, but moral and courage Moral courage is the most important. Moral courage is the courage to overcome the fears that are present in daily life, the stresses of study, of grades, of personal relationships and responsibilities. And the worst fear, I think, of all is that we might let someone down. Our family, our co-workers, our fellow soldiers, those fears are as intense as any in combat. Physical courage can win a battle or a ball game, but moral courage can change the world. And by the way, <clears throat> courage is not a guy thing. In my life, it is the women who are the most courageous. Where were the apostles during the crucifixion? They ran. Only his mother and the women stayed with him. No battlefield courage greater than the courage of motherhood. They understand the two o'clock in the morning courage that Napoleon talked about. No pain a soldier can suffer to match that of childbirth. And look at the Olympics. Look at that horizontal wooden beam. Have you ever seen a man on that thing? Are you kidding me? <clears throat> now as an aside, Wealth can be a part of success, and our, need, our youth need to reject the demonization of the successful by some who themselves are demeaned by their envy. My experience with the wealthy in America is that they are smarter than I am. They work harder than I do. They are more competitive and more courageous than I am, and only sometimes are they luckier than I am. Most of the wealthy I know are very generous, and for good reason. Many of them know what it means to be poor. They had the courage to work their way out, which is what makes America what it is. I heard a lecture recently on the value of failure in the lives of the successful. I think it's important for young people to know that many of the most successful people have failed more than those who are considered failures. The successful kept competing. They were courageous. The failures quit. 
No such thing as failure unless we fail to learn from it. Risk, if risk is the father of innovation, failure is the mother of success. Jimmy Doolittle, a great American Medal of Honor recipient and a man who I had the privilege to know, he put it pretty well when he said, <clears throat> I believe in excellence and I believe in reward for excellence. I've tried all my life to do things as well as I could do them. Sometimes successfully, sometimes I failed. There have been disappointments and successes, and the successes are what you enjoy most. But the disappointments may be what you learn from the most, because you can analyze what happened, and you're better prepared to cope the next time. Jimmy Doolittle opened the skies for commercial aviation in America. We ought not to fail and be considered a winner, but we can fail and learn how to be a winner. The big danger is in losers who think they are winners and who fail to change. A great golfer, friend of mine, uh, told me that his children, who did not make it in the pros, were better golfers than he was, but they failed to learn from their mistakes. Courage, I would define, and everybody, I guess, has their own definition, but for me, courage I would define as reaching a breaking point, but not breaking. But courage is part, but only part of heroism. Later we will define the source of courage, but let's first define the indispensable component of a hero. Heroes may be courageous in all elements of our humanity, physical, great athlete, mental, an Einstein, moral, great religious leader, but there must be one key ingredient in anyone we look up to as a hero. And let me give you an example of a true hero. His name was <clears throat> James Coleman, they called him Pappy. Now Pappy was probably 20 years old, but he was the oldest of my medics, and so all the other guys were teenagers, so he was Pappy. One mission, when he got out of the chopper to retrieve the wounded from the battlefield, he was shot in the chicken plate, which is armor, knocked him down, got up, went back for the boom. He got shot again, knocked down. They finally found the sniper, killed the sniper. He got up and went and got the patients out of the battlefield. The next mission, he took a round right through his lips. When the crew rushed to help him, he said, not to worry, I just kissed the bullet that had my name on it. <laughs> Later, he was with me in a minefield. Everyone there was dead, wounded, and would not move. Pappy ran into the minefield, began rescuing the wounded. Now, things were going good. One, unfortunately, one trip, he set off a mine. It blew him and the crew chief up in the air and filled the aircraft with shrapnel, set his pants on fire, he landed, put the fire out, went back, and got the patients, and loaded them on my helicopter. I took him and the wounded to the hospital, and thank God he lived. In one year, he probably helped rescue over 3,000 wounded, earning dozens of medals, to include three Purple Hearts, three Silver Stars. He's in the Army Aviation Hall of Fame. There's no way to measure this man's courage, but that is not why he is a hero. With 18 years of service, Two years short of his pension, his family called. They needed him. He could have been Sergeant Major of the Army, but he left his career, he left his pension, and went home to take care of his family. Coleman was not a hero just because he was courageous. He was a hero because he was also a good person. The key ingredient is goodness. There should be no such thing as a bad person who we call a hero. Our society confuses heroes and celebrities, and this is dangerous to young people. They will emulate their heroes. Often celebrities are not always good people. A celebrity is someone who we may want to meet. A hero is someone who we should want to be like someone like Pappy Coleman. 
We need more heroes who wear dog tags, not capes, ride a fire truck rather than a horse, and drive a patrol car rather than a Formula One. By the way, one of the great honors of my life was when Pappy's wife called me. He'd been sick, it took us 30 some years to find him. And he was, he was not well, he was never well. <clears throat> and it was a great happy night for me. My beloved San Antonio Spurs had just kicked Miami's butt in the finals. And I was happy and she told me Pappy was dying. And I said, Rose, I know he's dying. But he's not gonna die today. And she says, yes, he is. And she wanted, she told me that his last wish was that I'd be in charge of his funeral and he died a couple hours after that. He wanted to be buried in Turkey Creek, Kentucky. That's Hatfield McCoy country. They don't speak English in Turkey Creek, Kentucky. And I had some very clear guidance from Pappy on how he wanted me to bury him. And I was really having trouble communicating with him, but we got it done and he got all his wishes as far as his burial went. Now, what's the key to courage? <clears throat> what activates, activates it in each one of us? Fear, of course, is an emotion. Courage is a decision. And so many so-called heroes are only doing that which they had to do out of fear. Medal of Honor, Honor recipients would know this, and we know that that's why so many of us do not deserve this medal. But there's a story about a football player that illustrates for me the key to courage. He was not a very good player, but his team was going to a bowl game many years ago. In those days, they traveled by train. He got word along the way that his dad was very ill, so he turned around, went back, his dad died. And shortly after the funeral, <clears throat> he caught the train, came back and joined the, his team at the bowl game. On the day of the game, he pleaded with the coach to let him play. As I said, he was not very good, but the coach decided that in memory of his father, they would let him start and then get him out before he did any damage. Well, he played sensationally. They kept him in. He was all over the place, in fact, scored the winning touchdown. The coaches were amazed, of course, and delighted, and asked him, how did you do it? He said, my dad was blind all my life, and this was the first time he could watch me play. Now, it took courage for that young man to be willing to ask his coach to play in such an important game and to compete against the very best under great pressure. But it was his faith that gave him the courage this football player had faith that his blind father was there, could finally see, and was watching him play football for the first time. And that faith inspired his courageous play. The foundation of courage is faith. The two are often confused, but it's the only rationale I've been able to articulate to explain some of the things I've seen in life and in combat. In combat, I coped with my fear through my faith, my faith was for me a substitute for fear. It was a source of calm, of comfort, and it gave me confidence to do things that for me would have otherwise been impossible. I never really experienced fear in combat saving lives. Fear is a debilitating thing. It's a horrible thing to see. It'll cause to happen that which caused it. So I knew if I got killed doing what I was doing, what a great way to die, trying to save the lives of my fellow soldiers. Fear is really our faith on trial, our faith under fire. Faith destroys fear. When fear knocks at your door, door, send faith to answer, and fear will be gone when you open the door. I can define my faith. I could not do it for others. I would not try. But somehow, it's all tied to love and to sacrifice, and in a simple belief that there's something beyond a particular time someone above and beyond the self, something beyond this life that makes living and dying worthwhile. I've never known anyone with enduring repetitive courage who was not also a person of faith. Now, what do veterans teach us about the key to happiness in life? Now, an old dust-off pilot friend of mine <clears throat> said happiness 
was to have someone to love, something to do, and something to look forward to. A lot of truth in that. But I mentioned sacrifice, which is, like courage, not well understood, but it is the key, I believe, to happiness. One can be very successful and not be happy. So let me define it for you. First, here's what my friend Hannah, how she defined it in a letter she wrote to me. She's about nine or so. She said, sacrifice. Sacrifice means giving to, some, giving to someone something you could have had for yourself. I believe it is best if everyone sacrifices. For example, I gave my little sister my last cupcake. Now, I think Hannah has a lot of it, but I would define sacrifice as love in action. You take that great emotion, love, and you do something with it, something nonverbal, like a cupcake. It's a sacrifice of great leaders, of teachers, of parents, of coaches, coaches especially of our veterans. It's special. A sacrifice, no bottom line, no material gain, no quid pro quo. All it will do is increase your capacity for more sacrifice. And I believe it will also increase one's capacity for fulfillment, for responsibility, and I believe for happiness itself. The more you sacrifice, the more you are able to sacrifice, the better you get at it and the happier you become. Also, the greater your capacity for sacrifice, the greater will be your capacity for responsibility and leadership. It's like lifting weights. <clears throat> the more you lift, the stronger you get. Sacrifice is kind of like love lifting, exercising love on behalf of our fellow human beings. And I would also add gratitude as a source of happiness, sadly lacking in some of us, but I think it's essential to happiness how can one be happy and not know how much we have to be grateful for? As I said, most veterans don't believe we did America a favor by our sacrifice. We believe God did us a favor by allowing us to be born in this great country. We are grateful. We are happy to be Americans. A friend of mine who was a POW for six years said that happiness for him was having a doorknob on the inside of his room. He was grateful just to be free, just to get up in the morning and see that doorknob. Military people, others too, are accustomed to discipline. Now, it may, it may sound odd, but I think discipline is also a source of happiness. We read that the Lord disciplines those he loves and that there is no justice without love. Very often to be the object of discipline means we are the object of somebody's love. And that should make us happy. I used to tell my soldiers that you can't care for soldiers and not correct them. Now, it's been said that love in practice is a harsh and dangerous thing compared to love in dreams. And I've kept over my desk for many years James Russell Lowell saying, all the beautiful sentiments in the world weigh less than a single lovely action, an act of love, a sacrifice. I think marriage reminds us of this truth. It's easy to profess our love. Much more difficult are the sacrifices that prove it. And I think our wives make this point very clear. They want some proof, nonverbal, usually expensive proof that we love them. <laughs> but it's through sacrifice <clears throat> that we show our love for our country, our patriotism. And if you agree with my definition of sacrifice, it's easy to see that a soldier's love our military's love is the foundation for the security of our people. And for that reason, it's vital that we be a lovable people worthy of our soldiers' sacrifice. Now, what do veterans teach us about the key to our future? Which brings me to patriotism, which is the key to our future. A patriot is not someone who says simply they love their country. A patriot is someone who is willing to prove they love their country through their support and defense of their country. A patriot is, by definition, someone who is extremely proud of their country. 
Now, unfortunately, for the first time in many years, Gallup asked young people how proud they were to be Americans. Fewer than a majority, for the first time, said they are extremely proud. The source of this change may be that patriotism not, is not as emphasized in education as it once was. A democratic society cannot survive without patriots. Now, another source of our declining pride in America may be the dismal state of our basic knowledge of who we are as a nation. And I understand here in this great college, you focus a lot on that. A recent survey found that only one in six Americans can pass a quiz on basic American history. It's frightening, but true that one in seven high school students believe that we started World War II by dropping the atomic bomb on Japan. We cannot love who we are if we don't know who we are. The decline in patriotism based on a lack of pride and knowledge of America could prove disastrous in any demanding crisis of the future. If you doubt that, just look at the ignorance of some of our politicians about who we are. Our youth need to be educated and inspired in the wonders of our country if we are to survive. Young must, people must love their country if they are to support and defend it. They must believe we are a lovable people, an exceptional people if this is to work. Tough job. When so many do not believe that we are in any way special. Now I have a speech I give on American exceptionalism. Relax. I'm not going to give it. But it boils down to three things. We are exceptional because we are an exceptionally courageous people. We are an exceptionally compassionate people. And we are an exceptionally competitive people. And as a famous historian once said, America is great because America is good. We were founded on good, short for God, on a belief in God. You can't have one without the other. Now, if anyone's got a better definition of exceptionalism, I'd like to hear it. But I break it down. For example, we're free, as is most of the world, because of America's courage, mostly our veterans. No country is more generous in their compassion and care for others, hurricanes, tsunamis, you name it. We are very, very compassionate in our care for others in the world and in America. And it's the unleashing of the free exercise of competition granted by our co Constitution that's the basis of our prosperity. My bottom line is we will cease to be exceptional when we cease to be courageous, compassionate, and competitive, and good. In one example, I believe we are trending to socialism because we have people who don't want to compete perhaps because of cowardice or laziness or both. Now, children, as I said, learn best through witness, through examples. And I think a great example of patriotism is illustrated by a dear friend of mine, Sergeant Webster Anderson. <clears throat> Big, powerful, black uh, artillery sergeant. Early one morning, his attack, his unit was attacked by the communist forces and the initial attack, they pretty much took off both of his legs, yet he continued to fight. Later, they threw a hand grenade into his position, and as he caught it and tried to throw it clear of his men, it pretty much blew off his arm. Still, he fought on. I flew in and picked up what was left of Webster and his wounded after he had inspired his men to defeat the communists. Miraculously, the medic saved his life, but his efforts to save his men cost him both legs and an arm, but it earned him the Medal of Honor. Now, Webster and I became very close. He thought I saved his life. Physician saved his life. And some years later, we were speaking at a school in Oklahoma. And one of the young men raised his hand and asked Webster if he would do what he did again, knowing what it cost him, two legs and an arm, and Webster's answer moves me to this day. He raised his good arm and he says, kid, I only have one arm left, but my country can have it any time they want. 
I'm sure that those young people will be forever inspired by the words of that great black soldier propped up before them who was more plastic than he was flesh. His sacrifice was an investment in their future, and I think some of them realize it for the first time. Webster defined patriotism for those young people. Which brings me to the very purpose of an education, and I think that this is well known here. This is an extraordinary college. I think it's a paradigm for what the colleges and universities across this country should be. But the ancients extolled the virtue of piety, which they defined as an intimacy with God, in their case, God's. They said it underlies the virtue of justice without which we perish. Piety is often a joke today, much like chastity. The ancient philosophers believed the purpose of education was both moral and civil. During the Enlightenment time, they changed to the belief that moral and civic education was not the business of the state. Thomas Jefferson was a devoted son of the Enlightenment time, but he disagreed. He agreed with the ancients that both civil and moral were most important. He was so dedicated to education that he ignored his presidency on his tombstone and put on it instead that he was the father of the University of Virginia. Jefferson also agreed with another ancient, Pericles, on the need for individuals to control their desires and even curtail their own rights when necessary to make sacrifices in the service of their community without whose protection civil rights could not exist. It's another form of, of, of patriotism. In short, democracy and patriotism were inseparable, and I would add piety, for there is no democracy without justice. An education must produce patriots. The highest form of patriotism, as I say, is service to our youth. We've often, in our time, seen patriotism blasted. We hear Samuel Johnson's remark that patriotism is the last refuge of a scoundrel. Johnson did not mean a real and generous love of country, but the pretended patriotism, which so many politicians of all ages and countries have made as a cloak for their self-interest. One final point on patriotism. <clears throat> I'm working on this. But it has to do with developing a team mentality, teaching children to be team players. It's the us in the US. To be part of something beyond themselves, the unselfish sacrifice thing. If you are a Christian, certainly as a Catholic, we believe God is a team. Three persons, one divine nature. I think he designed man kind also to be a team. The whole person is really a team. Three parts, as I mentioned, mental, moral, and physical. All three need attention, need development, or the whole person becomes unwholesome. As the poet John Doan put it, no man is an island entire of itself. Every man is a piece of the continent, a part of the main. Any man's death diminishes me because I am involved in mankind. Therefore, never send to know for whom the bells toll, it tolls for thee. So we're all part of teams, family, school, city, nation, etc. If something happens to one of us, it happens to all of us. So true of our nation and the need to grow patriots. Now, out in the West, where I grew up, we used horses to pull logs out of the woods. <clears throat> and we used to have horse pulling contests. In one contest, the winner pulled 9,000 pounds, and the runner-up pulled something less than 9,000 pounds. They decided to see what they could pull together as a team. Guess what? As a team, they pulled 27,000 pounds. A team mentality is essential in citizenship, in patriotism, and in our future. A friend of mine was rude enough on the golf course to pull out a tape measure, which we used to measure closest to the pin. Then he noted our lifespan, 75 inches or whatever the hell it was, and he says, here you are, Brady, the end of the tape. Well, for the young people, I would say that here you are, this is your life, you're here, someday you'll be here where I am, why not build something in between? A monument. In the end, I found that the treasures of life are nothing but memories. 
Why not good memories? Start building those memories. And I think they will be golden if you follow the golden rule, the Ten Commandments, and the Sermon on the Mount, which I believe together condense the wisdom of all time, the great wisdom of all time. Be good, the golden rule, live good, the Sermon on the Mount, avoid evil, the Ten Commandments. Now, in my faith, we have a doctrine on grace. <clears throat> it teaches that there's a treasure chest filled with grace. It was filled by the sacrifice of Jesus and the saints, and it's there to help us all as we struggle to do what's right. We all draw from that chest of grace through no particular merits of our own, but simply because of God's love for us. Our freedom is like grace, a treasure chest. It was filled by the sacrifices of our veterans, our heroes, our patriots, and we all draw from that chest of freedom, often through no merits of our own, but simply because of their love for us. The chest of grace is inexhaustible because it comes from God. Not so the chest of freedom. It must continuously be replenished by our sacrifices. And so that's my message to you from our veterans, those who sacrificed their youth, that liberty might grow old over many years, countless battlefields, over the bodies of millions of dead, a message from this medal that the values of courage based in faith, sacrifice based in love, will lead to an incredible capacity for service to others, to patriotism, and eventually to the security of America. Peace, as I said, is the ultimate victory of all warriors. We must remoralize America if we are to survive. And it begins with the likes of you young people here. Now, can I give you a test or is it, are you all too beyond that? All right. <clears throat> Does America have a nobility? If so, who? Good Lord, I thought there were smart people in this college. What's the key to success in life? What's the source of courage? What's the key to happiness in life? How do you find sacrifice? Love and action. What is essential to a hero? Goodness. What's the key to our future? Patriotism. What is essential to patriotism, support, and defend America? And that's the quiz we give to all the young people that we talk, through, talk to throughout America. So let me say thank you for allowing to be with you. God bless you all. You're lucky to be in this great college, that's for sure. Thank you, General Brady. We'll have a, General Brady's going to take a couple questions. So we've got uh, two people in the aisles with a mic. So if you have a question for General Brady, if you could come to the, to the aisles and uh, see the two gentlemen, they'll uh, hold the mic for you. So why don't we start on, do we have anybody on this side over here? There's a hand. There's a hand and there's the mic, sir. All right. I just wanted to see what the significance of the picture is. Significant of what? The picture. Oh. I didn't see it. It's uh, that that is a uh, that's a picture. They asked me for some photographs of Vietnam, and that was the only one I could find where I'm actually making a pickup on the battlefield in Vietnam. That's a Huey helicopter, a helicopter ambulance, and they're loading some Vietnamese patients onto the helicopter. That was my first tour. Thank you for joining us tonight, General Brady. You mentioned how the human person is divided between a physical, mental, and moral. And I think a lot of people think of the military in a more physical sense, with going through boot camp and being in war. And I'm curious how the military has prepared you and built you up mentally and morally as well. That's a good question. <clears throat> There's no, you know, combat is a very, very physical thing. But as I said, uh, faith is the key to courage. 
And the, and the military, the American military is one of the very few militaries in the world that has a chaplain's corps. And we have, we, we, a, a soldier will fight best if he knows he's going to be taken care of physically, if he gets shot, and, and uh, spiritually. So we have the chaplains with him on the battlefield, we have the medics with him on the battlefield, and uh, the military, I mean, it is, it is of all the things in America most concerned with the whole man. They keep you physically fit, morally straight, and uh, of course you have the intellectual challenges of whatever your profession might be. So I think the military addresses all three pretty well. Did I miss one? You look like I didn't answer your question. <laughs> I think you did, thank you. I think that's it for questions, sir. Another round of applause for General Blake. Oh, all right. Thank, thank you, sir. Thank you, thank you. The, the last part of our program is a salute to each branch of the service. And to lead us is my colleague and fellow brother Navy Marine Corps Blue Green team member, Jeff Rogers. Jeff serves as the college as the Associate Dean of Men, where he helps shape and mold the young boys who start out here as freshmen into strong men by the time they graduate. Jeff is one of the few people on campus that is known by one name, Chief, because of that 26-year Navy service ending as a Chief Hospital Corpsman. As I mentioned during my introduction of Jeff's wife, Chief and his family have served our nation all over the globe. He finished his career recruiting for the Navy Medical Service Corps, which introduced him to Hillsdale College. At the retirement in 2011, he joined the staff. Jeff and I actually started working on, for the college on the very same day in August of 2011, and it is my pleasure to introduce what I refer to as the best man on campus, Jeff Rogers. All right, all right. It is very patriotic for us to do this. And so, the United States Coast Guard. You're in the Coast Guard, stand with me as we sing the United States Coast Guard. <laughs> so here's the Coast Guard marching song we sing on land and sea through surf and storm and howling gale. I shall our purpose be. Semper Protest is our guide, our fame, our glory too. To fight, to save, or fight, to die. Aye, Coast Guard, we are for you. All right. Next, the United States Air Force. Off we go into the wild blue yonder, climbing high into the sun. Here they come, zooming to meet our thunder. Adam boy, give them the gun, give them the gun. Down we die, spouting our flame from under. Off with one hell of a roar. We live in fame or go down in flame. Hey, nothing can stop the U.S. Air Force. All right. I might add the only anthem that has a curse word in it. All right. The United States Navy. <laughs> Anchors away, my boys. Anchors away, farewell to foreign shores. We sail at break of day to our last night ashore. Drink to the foam until we meet. Once more, here's wishing you a happy voyage home. Maybe. The only one that talks about drinking. <laughs> <laughs> the, 
the United States Army. First to fight for the right and to build the nation's might and the army goes rolling along. Proud of all we have done, fighting to the battles won, and the army goes rolling along. Then it's hi, hi, hey, the army's on its way. Count off the cadence loud and strong. For we go, you will always know, and the army goes rolling along. All right. The United States Marine Corps. From the halls of Matazuma to the shores of Tripoli, we will fight our country's battles in the air, our land, and sea. First to fight for the land and freedom and to keep our honor clean. We are proud to claim the title of the United States Marines. Woo that brings us to the end of the evening. I need to, uh, a couple things, some housekeeping matters. First, due to the uh, State Health Department limitation on indoor gatherings of no more than 50 guests per reception, we are splitting up the guests alphabetically for the dessert reception. So if your last name begins with an A through M, we will ask you to go to the cereal dining room and N through Z to Dow A and B. There will be six seats per table. Friends are invited to sit together, and we request that guests remain seating during the reception. And unfortunately, students, you're going to need to go back and study. You are asked not to attend the dessert reception <laughs> due to the increase in, the, in some cases we're seeing. Secondly, and more importantly, some thank yous. I would ask that you join me in a round of applause some, for some very important people who helped make tonight possible. The special events team, the audiovisual team, the Dow Center staff who provided outstanding support that allowed us here on campus to hear and those online to hear and see General Brady's inspirational message. And to our president's office who hosted this event and the person on that team, Gracie Humphreys, who quarterbacked everything remotely from North Carolina. So thank you, Gracie, and thank you all of our uh, colleagues and give them a round of applause. And the last thank you, uh, as I give this thank you, I would ask General Brady and his fellow Vietnam veterans to please stand. I think um, all of the veterans who have served since Vietnam, especially in Iraq and Afghanistan, like myself, we have been the recipients of an outpouring of support and thanks that really goes unmatched. You cannot tell somebody that you served and not be thanked. And uh, I think that we received some of that thanks from some people who did not do that for the Vietnam veterans. I think it's a, it's a dark stain on our nation's history that we did not give them the recognition and the thanks that they deserve. So that's why I ask you to stand, and that's why I like to end tonight with that thank you again to those Vietnam veterans who served us so proudly and so well. So thank you, Vietnam veterans. And with that, Thank you for all coming. God bless Hillsdale College and God bless the United States of America.